morning, Victory. Hey, let's welcome Hamilton Mill as you join us live at our 11 o'clock service. We're so glad to have you and all of you that are watching us online. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 19. We're going to read in just a minute, but I want to set this sermon up uh, so that you get the right, the right idea of what we're going to talk about. Now, we are in a series that we're calling The Story of Family, and I know this, whenever we talk about family, it kind of unveils some things that maybe we've been kind of keeping below the surface and usually after every service, I have people come up to me and all kinds of stuff, you know, counsel me, pray for me, my marriage, my family, and all this. Every one of us has different stories. And our goal in this particular series is to help you start a good story for your family. Amen? So no matter what state you're in, no matter where, where you're coming from, whether you have a good marriage or you have a bad marriage or you're on the verge of divorce or everything is just starting uh, or you're single and you're not even married, this is all gonna help you to have a better story. In fact, I had a couple different people come up to me after the last service and they said, Pastor, this message that you preached today was just for me. I, I'm gonna go home now and unpack my bags. I was getting ready to leave my husband he was out of town, and I was going to surprise him when he got home by not being there, <laughs> but now I can't do that. Those are the kind of stories we want to create in victory, amen? That's the kind of stories we want. All right, so this particular message is kind of the foundation of everything for family. This, this is the story, what we call the story of covenant love, and when I talk about covenant love, a covenant's kind of a a biblical word that maybe a lot of us don't understand. And I know I didn't understand it when I was a single adult growing up in, in the church. I never understood the word covenant. I understood the word love. We all have some sort of story of love. But that story doesn't always go the way that we planned. It starts off one way and it sometimes ends another way. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to take this particular weekend and I'm going to kind of dive into this a little bit, what that looks like. But before I do that, I want to set this up by just letting you know that the primary audience that I'm targeting right now, believe it or not, is not the married people, it's the single people. So how many, how many single folks do we have here in Hamilton Mill? Let me see your hands. Okay. I want you to know something. Those of you that are married need to know this, that for the first time in the history of America, in the history of America, for the last five years, this has been the case. There are more single people, single adults in church than there are married couples. That's never been the case in America ever in the history of the church. Church has always been a place for married couples, families, and so forth. But now, singles are coming in larger numbers and not getting married. There are a lot of singles that come to church, and they're maybe dating somebody. Some of them are living together, but they're not getting married. There's a lot of reasons for that. I know that. And I, I recognize that, but the reality is that one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons is because they don't necessarily like what they've seen in marriage. They may have come from broken homes. They may have friends that have been married and are now divorced or friends that are in bad marriages. Maybe they've even been married and now they're single again and they're kind of afraid to get married again. And as a result, many, many people that are now single are finding themselves back out there trying to figure out relationships. Now, let me ask you a question. Those of you that are single that raised your hand, a lot of people raised their hand here. I'm sure at Hamilton Mill is the same way. How many of you that are single think you would like someday to be married? Let me just see your hands. Half the hands didn't even go up. Part of it could be you with your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend, and you're kind of like, <laughs> you gonna raise your hand? I'll raise mine. <laughs> but some of you, you don't, you don't even, you're not even thinking about it. You don't even care about it. You know, I don't want to get married. I don't want to get married. I like my single life. I like my freedom and so on and so forth. And part of that is because you've just never had good examples. Because marriage, if you, if you do it right, it's the best thing that can ever happen to you on the earth. If you have a marriage, let me just say this about marriage. Marriage is the closest thing in the earth to heaven or hell. <laughs> And those of you that have been married say, amen. amen. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Some days it's heaven, some days it's hell. All right. So 
I started thinking about singles first. And I thought, gosh, everything's so changed since I was single. It's been a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm married almost 36 years, uh, and, and I'm not planning on doing it again. I mean, this is the one for me for the rest of my life, right? I got married when I was 25, and fortunately, I was in a good church that was teaching me some of the things you're going to learn today, but, but back then, you didn't have what singles do today, which is called online dating. Online dating has now replaced meeting people in public places. It's, it's, it's the primary way people meet each other, and there's a lot of couples here that you've met online. They, they say right now, statistically, there's 100 million, approximately 100 million single adults in America right now of dating age, and of those 100 million, 40 million a day are online, connecting with each other in some form of online dating. So that tells me that when we're finished with this message today, some of you are going to go back home, <laughs> going to get on your iPhone, or you're going to get on your computer, zip, 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 check, 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 check. You're going to put your profile out there, and you might have several uh, different dating sites. In fact, I looked up the top 10 dating sites uh, in America. I'm going to give them to you in case you didn't know what they were. <laughs> top 10. Zusk is number one, Z-O-O-S-K. I know somebody, what? 40 million a day on Zusk, just on that one, it's because it's free. You don't actually have to pay for that one. But you get what you pay for, I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> Who knows what's out there? eHarmony, y'all know eHarmony. Elite singles, uh, that's another notch up. You, 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 I'm just, I'm a... I'm not having any sevens or below, only nines and tens. I'm going on that, that dating site. Now, you need to be one if you're going to get on there. They might not let you on there. Maybe you have to pass a test. I don't know. Nope, that one doesn't get on. Nope, nope. All right, match.com. That's the one that a lot of people know on TV. Our time. Our time is for singles over 50. Did you all know there was a site for that, singles over 50? Our time. The other one of over 50 is called Silver Singles. That's another big one. Silver Singles. OK Cupid. Y'all know that one? OK Cupid, that's for the younger generation. Plenty of Fish. <laughs> wow. Tinder. Tinder's the big one also for, for young people hooking up. <laughs> Don't want a long-term relationship. They go on Tinder. <laughs> and Hinge. I don't know what Hinge, I think it hinges you to the different social media sites. I don't know exactly what that is. Some of you know. All right, so I looked up those. Those are the main ones that everybody's on, and, and some people are on all 10 of those. <laughs> They're all 10. They got their profile out there, different pictures and different ages, you know, they, when they were 10 and when they were 20. <laughs> I finally updated my profile picture on Facebook and, and uh, Instagram. I hadn't done it in about five years. And I put it on there and I looked at it and I went, man, you are, you're old. <laughs> you, you really aged in the last five years. You got gray hair now, silver hair. And, uh, but, but some of us haven't updated in about 10 years. And so when people look at us, we, they have no idea what we really look like right now. All right, so here's the new, th these are the funny ones. Uh, you know, this, we need a little you know, levity in this because Sometimes when you start talking about serious subjects, uh, it can get too heavy. So I, I looked up the funny sites, and here was some of the top ones that I found. Spoon meets spoon. <laughs> what does that mean? Pimp my profile. <laughs> that's, a, that's a real dating site. Pimp my profile. Single and sober. Whoa. <laughs> Haven't done drugs for three days. Let's go out. Wingman, the wingman is your friend opens up a site for you and monitors all the people that are coming through and then, and then matches them to you. That's your wingman. I love this one. Farmer wants a wife. <laughs> Just take a picture of you females in, on a tractor. Huh? Farmer wants a wife. Here I am. Star Trek dating. What is that? I got the guys, but what do the women look like? <laughs> this is really what got me. Ugly schmucks. I mean, that's where you just 
basically, you've just given up. <laughs> I'm ugly. I might as well get on the site that people are like me. And let's just put ourselves out there and just choose among ourselves. We're all ugly. There's somebody, how many found this? There's somebody for everybody. I mean, I've seen some, some quite, quite some interesting <laughs> couples together. Check this one out, clown dating. You dress up like a clown and go out on a date, okay. And then there was the, 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 the racial, racial ones. Black people meet black people. Latino meet Latino people. Asians meet Asian people. But they, you know, it, it's just not politically correct to say white people meet white people. <laughs> That, that doesn't work in today's society. So it's white people meet anyone that's not white people. <laughs> that's acceptable. That's socially acceptable. <laughs> eHarmony says there's 29 things that you are compatible to that, make, that match you up. And I, I breezed through there and I realized that had I had online dating back when I met Colleen, we would have never been matched on eHarmony because none of the 29 things are we compatible with. And what I've learned about family and relationships and marriage is that a lot of people think it's all about your compatibility, but the reality is that if you've been married for a while, you know this, that you start off compatible, but that changes. Things change. You, you change. Your personality sometimes changes. Your body changes. Your, your career path changes. Your personality, all those things can change. And all of a sudden, you're no longer compatible, and then before long, you're starting to think, well, well, maybe we should have never married. Maybe we weren't meant for each other. Maybe that was a mistake. Maybe I married the wrong person. In fact, that's the question that I get from single people all the time. Like, how do I know it's the right person? All right, so here's a new, a new website that's now out there for single people. In fact, Saturday Night Live did a little take on it, so let, let's just watch this one. This, was, this is a good one. Unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of times, it, after you start this process, like most people do trying to meet the right person, you end up settling. You end up settling because you're so desperate to get married, because your parents want you to be married, because they want grandkids, and every time you meet somebody, well, I got just the right person for you. And, and eventually, you just kind of like, okay, I guess there's no real match for me, so I'll just settle for this person. And if you're not careful, you'll start a relationship that has nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the Lord putting you together, nothing to do with any of that. It's all about you know, either some scientific process through match dating or through just settling. And what ends up happening is it creates all these relationships out there that have very little chance of being successful. So how does that shift? How do you shift that around? The first thing you've got to understand before you start even dating, before you even start relationships, this is when you're in high school, you need to learn this, if nothing, at least in by college, is that a true biblical godly relationship starts with this understanding of covenant love, completely different kind of love than what we know in the earth. It's not a feeling, it's not emotions, it's not compatibility. It's something that God gives us when we start our journey with God. Now, Jesus kind of describes it a little bit when they asked him about divorce. When they asked him about divorce, and by the way, if you've been through divorce, just so you understand this, Jesus, when he talks about divorce in the New Testament, he is talking specifically and in the, in the context of Jewish people under the old covenant law of Moses. If you read into the new covenant after Jesus, after the redemption on the cross, you see that there is forgiveness for divorce. However, God still views divorce through the lens of something that destroys something. It creates violence. In fact, he says in Malachi, he says he hates divorce. He doesn't hate people that have been through divorce, but he hates divorce because it creates violence in the kingdom of God, in the heavens, it says. So Jesus is asked this question, and here's what happens. In Matthew 19, in verse 1, it says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him and asked, is it lawful for a man 
to divorce his wife for, for any and every reason. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, he made them male and female. Now notice the context. He made them male and female and said, for this reason, I made them male and female, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So we can see pretty clearly that for the most part, not for everyone, but for the most part, God does want men and women to come together and get married. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, what do you think about that statement? Do you, do you all agree with that? Do you, how many of you agree with that statement? Let let no one separate what God joins together, all right? So most of you raised your hand. Not everybody raised their hand because maybe not everybody agrees with that. So Jesus was making this strong statement on marriage because of what it represents to God. Marriage is the strongest statement to God of our relationship with God in the earth because marriage is not based in biblical terms, in God's view, just on your feelings. Just like your salvation is not based on feelings, although some people do respond to Christ out of their feelings and their emotions, and they might say yes to Christ in a moment of feeling that way, but how many of you know that that doesn't necessarily mean you're committing your life to Christ yet? Feelings is not how we base our relationship with God, and aren't you glad God doesn't base his relationship with us on his feelings? Otherwise, we might not have a relationship with God. He could have gotten angry with us any given moment, amen? And so he's saying, this marriage thing is the representation or reflection of your relationship with me. So every marriage, biblical marriage, people that understand God is a reflection of of their relationship with God. So when a marriage starts to go bad, if it starts to have trouble, I can just tell you, it's very simple, it's not complex. Somebody in that marriage is drifting away from God. Somebody's drifting away, and, 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 and you might wanna argue with that, you might wanna fight with that, but I'm just telling you that when God brings two people together, he doesn't intend for them to divorce. So there's a covenant that, he cut, that you're cutting with each other that says, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna base my marriage just on how I feel, but I'm gonna base my marriage on a covenant, on a covenant that I'm cutting with this person for life. That's why when you say the marriage vows, you say for richer, for poor, for in sickness and in health, till death do us part. But that doesn't necessarily mean everybody in the church agrees with that. That's why sometimes when people in the church have marriage problems, Instead of coming for counsel from God's word, they usually go outside the church to a secular counselor that aren't, isn't gonna give them God's word. They're just gonna try to psychologically analyze what they need to change in their way that they relate to each other, hoping that they can keep them together. And by the way, that'll be $145, please. And usually you can string them along for a while because there's no word to purge out the real problem of the marriage. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if that's what you do to solve your marriage, there's a pretty good chance it won't make it. If you don't submit it to God and godly counsel, people that will give you the word, there's a pretty good chance your marriage won't make it. And so I wanna encourage you, if you are having trouble in your marriage, instead of hiding that fact, instead of getting outside the church and going to people that don't necessarily agree that what God has joined together, let not man separate, if you, if you do submit it to counsel, there's a good chance you can rescue your marriage. Because again, I wanna remind you, your marriage based on God is not based on feelings, it's based on a covenant. All right, now there's two competing value systems that you have to be aware of in the earth for how we build our relationships. There's a marriage value system under Christ and there's a marriage value system that I call the humanistic value system. Let me give you two, the two of them side by side. In a Christian, truly Christian-based marriage, it's based on a covenant. In a humanistic-based marriage, it's based on feelings. When someone comes to you and says, I don't feel love for you anymore, 
They're, they're basically making a humanistic statement to you that that's how I'm basing my relationship with you. It's not based on covenant, it's based on how I feel. In a Christian-based value system, it's about meeting the other person's needs. In a humanistic value system, it's based on the other person meeting your needs. In a Christian value system, it's two people becoming one. In a humanistic value system, it's two people remaining independent of each other. In a Christian value system, the goal is to please God in the marriage. In humanistic value system, the goal is to please self. In a Christian value system, you're governed by the word of God. In a humanistic value system, you're governed by your emotions and your opinions. In a humanistic, I mean, a Christian value system, you're committed for life. In a humanistic value system, divorce is an option. Now, we started learning this years ago when Colleen and I first got married and before we got married, we understood that this, this is based on a covenant because we were taught this in the church. And then we got married and we discovered that in marriage, your feelings shift. They move back and forth. They go up and down. You have days when everything's going well and days when it's not. There's even sometimes weeks when things are not going well. But because it's based on a covenant, we realized this person that I'm committing to is not based on my feelings. It's based on my relationship with God. And if I'm having trouble with my feelings, it's usually because I'm having trouble with my relationship with God. And if I want to fix this, I can't fix this without fixing this. Did you hear what I just said? I'm surprised by how many people come to victory, come to victory, listen to these teachings over the years, and they'll be married for many years, and then all of a sudden, one of the members of the marriage will come up to me, and they'll come up to me in the lobby, and they'll say, pray for me, pastor. My spouse just walked out. They just left me. And I said, well, I'm sure there's a lot more to that story. They say, yeah, there's a lot more to that story, but basically, they just came to me, and they said, I, I don't love you anymore. I, I don't love you. In other words, I don't have feelings for you anymore, so I'm out. I'm gone. And... At that point, what are you going to do? What are, what are you going to do? The Bible says in, in the book of Corinthians, it says, when an unbeliever departs, let them depart. Let me just say this. If you're a believer in Christ, a true follower of Christ, listen to me carefully. Unless there is a biblical reason where there's been unfaithfulness in the marriage or there's serious abuse in the marriage, you're not following Christ by walking out of that marriage. You're not hearing the Holy Spirit say that, that's another voice that you're listening to. Are you following me? And when you start to make those decisions, what you're also saying to God is, God, I'm not only walking out of this marriage, but I'm sort of walking out of my relationship with you as well. Because I know that I can't just walk out of this marriage and continue on my relationship with you as if nothing happened. Did you hear what I just said? All right, so I said to my wife, I said, all right, listen, we, are, we, are, we, we have our differences. We have our different personalities. You're strong. I'm strong. We're going to have some times when we're going to battle with each other. But we are covenant together. This is a covenant marriage. I'm not planning on doing this again. This is forever. So we might as well make the best of it. Because I don't want to spend my whole marriage arguing, fighting, being bitter, having problems, unforgiveness, talking about all the bad things we do. Let's learn to make this marriage work. Let's don't make the marriage based on our emotions. Let's make it based on covenant. And let's move forward. All right, let me, let me tell you what covenant is. Covenant is the strongest word in the Bible that describes both our relationship with God and with each other. It reflects a solemn agreement between two parties in which there's total commitment by each party. All right, so if you're married, can, can I ask you a question? Do you feel like you are totally committed to this marriage. You're all in. You're all in. Now, let me just say this. You're all in in marriage says you're all in with God. If you're not all in in the marriage, it's because you're not all in with God. You haven't made a full commitment because remember, when, when you're going to God, it's look at this. It's not my will, but it's your will be done in me. 
It's not what I want to do. It's what do you want for me, God? A covenant is the first truth to enter human consciousness. It includes your life, your possessions, your children. Everything becomes one. You come to two to become one. Genesis describes what a covenant looks like between God and Abraham in Genesis 17. I'm going to read a few verses. It says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless, and then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will now be Abraham. He inserted Two of the letters of his name, Jehovah, right in the middle of Abram's name. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Now, what God is saying to Abram, Abraham, is I'm going to make a covenant. It's the strongest word I can use to describe my relationship with you, Abraham, that for the rest of eternity, what I'm about to say over you will never change. I'm going to do this in our relationship with you forever. Now, I don't know if you've ever studied the history of the Jewish people which came from Abraham, but it's a pretty interesting story. When you watch how the Jewish people who were God's chosen people from Abraham, God said, I'm going to bless you, that no matter how much they rebelled against God, fought against God, were stiff-necked against God, cursed God, turned away from God, God would never break covenant with them. I'm going to never leave you. I'm going to never forsake you. It's an interesting phenomenon. When you look at Israel, Israel is the most fascinating country in the world. You have all these Jewish people in Israel that don't even believe or follow God. Most of the Jewish people are not religious people. They're secular humanistic people in Israel. They don't believe in God, don't follow God, and yet it's the most entrepreneurial country in the world. There are more entrepreneurs per capita coming out of Israel than all of Europe and Asia combined. The only country that competes with the business model of Israel is the United States of America, which is 10 times its size. The ideas, the business ideas, the prosperous ideas, you've got all kinds of major businesses, corporations, uh, political leaders, scientists, inventors, everything coming out of, uh, usually they control the banking system, they control the, the media system around the world, and yet most of them don't even follow God, but God continues to keep his covenant with those people. He's doing that to, dis, to, to show us how much he's committed to those he has covenant with. Now, here's the good news. When Jesus came, who was a Jew, by the way, and died on a cross, he did it to cut a covenant with you forever. He says, I'm dying on this cross for you forever. I'm going to cut a covenant with you, and I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you, and I'm going to do this in spite of the fact that you're a sinner. In spite of the fact that you're doing your own thing, I'm going to die on a cross while you curse me on that cross. I'm going to trade my life for you so that now you enter into a covenant just like Abraham had with God. In fact, the Bible says you are now a joint heir with Jesus Christ and of the seed of Abraham. You have access into the fullness of God's blessings. Many times we don't access them because we're ignorant of the blessings and we don't go after them. We don't realize our own inheritance, so we live way below the level of what God created us to be. But you are a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Listen to me, not based on your behavior, but based on God's covenant. By grace, you've been saved, not by your works, lest any man should boast. Amen. 
This is the demonstration of God's covenant love that's so far past our natural understanding of feelings and emotions and ups and downs with relationships. Dr. Uh, uh, Henry Trumbull says this. He says, anyone who chooses to enter a covenant must make a complete surrender of self to the one with which they are covenanted. You must so love and trust that you are willing to merge your separate individuality into a dual personality of which God becomes an integral part. As high as God is above man, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, so are the sanct so higher the sanctity, the rights, and the promise of a marriage covenant above the promise of worldly love. It's not your worldly love that sustains marriage, but from now on, the marriage covenant that sustains your love. Wow, if we could just get that, your marriage would be so much better. Let me give you some covenant parallels between our marriage and Jesus. Let me give you some covenant parallels. For example, in marriage, when you start your marriage, you give of yourself to the other person. In Jesus, he gave of himself in cutting covenant for us. He gave of himself. In marriage, you give something of value. You give a ring when you get married. Now, the new thing for young adults is to give a rubber ring. Doesn't cost any money. That way, if we divorce, you know, we just throw it in the trash can. Let me just give you a clue. That's not the way God intended for you to get married. I know this is gonna surprise. I know that's the cool thing. That's the hip thing. We're not materialistic, blah, blah, blah. Why should we spend all this money on a ring? Because it's a part of the covenant. It's a statement of value of the other person. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't value us at the level of a rubber ring? Y'all all right out there? Now, you can wear your rubber ring when you're exercising if you wanna wear that. But put a real ring on it, okay? Put the real deal on the finger. <laughs> Why? Because in Jesus, he gave his whole life for you. He gave us the most valuable thing that he could give for you, all right? In marriage, you get an exchange of names. You, you, if you're a, a woman, you give up your maiden name of your parents and you take on the name of your husband because you're leaving your father and your mother and you're now joining yourself to your husband. You take on his name as a part of that covenant. When we become Christians, we leave our natural life and we become Christians. We get, adopt the name of Christ, Christians, Christ-likeness. We're becoming like Christ. In a Marriage, you have terms, vows that are set forth. Jesus set them forth in the new covenant. He gives us the new terms for our relationship with him. In a marriage, there's a shedding of blood. There's supposed to be, when you get married, a shedding of blood because that means you're a virgin when you got married. Obviously, that's not the case for many people today. But back in the day, they would put a, a white linen sheet on the bed and when they consummated their marriage, if there was no blood, that meant that she had violated her body before she got married. And in the Bible, they said they would take her out and stone her to death. Hello. <laughs> There's a pretty good chance most of us wouldn't be sitting here today <laughs> if we were still functioning under the old covenant. Come on, somebody. Aren't you glad that Jesus gave us a new covenant of forgiveness? <laughs> that doesn't dismiss the fact that God still wants you to be a virgin. When you're young and single, he wants you to keep yourself pure before you get married. That's the highest form of bonding together, when you only bond with one person. You don't have the memory, the history of other people that you have to overcome. Colleen and I were not privy of that when we were single, and so when we came together, we had to break soul ties to other people that we had been with physically. In order for us to have a healthy marriage, we had to stop having sex for many months before we got married and then when we came together, we were ready to be married because we had gotten control of that part of our life. People who get married right after living together, having sex, usually bring, bring the spirit of, of immorality into their marriage, and they, and they battle with it their whole marriage. They battle with faithfulness, pornography, all kinds of things until you break those soul ties. Amen? Y'all all right out there? Single folks, are you having sex? What's up with that? 
You think that's okay with God? No, he wants you to be pure, and you can get pure again. You can regain a virgin heart again by just putting your body on the altar, amen, and coming and getting, getting it right. When Jesus died on a cross, he died and shed blood for us. He shed blood to purify us, to cleanse us. In marriage, there's a covenant meal that they celebrate around the marriage table. In, in our relationship with Jesus, it's communion. It's the marriage supper, the bread and the wine. All those are parallels with what a marriage is supposed to be like. All right, now, to kind of wrap this up, you need to understand there's three different kinds of love that we function in. Three different kinds. There's the eros love. Eros love is physical love. It's the attraction physically to somebody found in your body. That's the kind of love that we we say we make love many times. We're talking about eros love. Then there's phileo love. That's the emotional love. That's That's found in your soul. That's the relational component of love. That's I feel love for you. And then there is agape love, and that's the God kind of love that's found in your spirit, found in your spirit. Now, what God wants you to do is learn how to take all three and put them together. He's not denying them that they have value, but most people, when they get married, they get married from eros love and phileo love, not agape love. Usually, it's their physical attraction and their emotional attraction that puts them together, but how many of you know your physical and your emotional is, is, is volatile? It changes. All those things change, and if your marriage is based on those two kinds of love only, you will have trouble in marriage. You'll have trouble in marriage. That's why he says you have to have that third component called agape love. So basically, it's, it, it works together like this. The arrows part of you is your passion, the love of passion, the desire that leads to romance, uh, physical closeness, intimacy, sex, that God intended for two people to have in marriage. Then the phileo part is your intimacy, which involves a close-minded, close, closeness, a like-mindedness, emotional bonding that God wants you to have. But the third part is your decision to love. And your decision is your agape love. It's the commitment that encompasses a short-term Decision, I love you, with a long-term decision to maintain that love. I'm going to maintain that love. I've got to protect that love. That love is not going to be based solely on my physical attraction or my emotional attraction. It's going to be based on my decision to love you regardless, to love you unconditionally the way God loves me. When you start to love at that level, That's when marriage takes on a whole different dimension of power and oneness. Now, this will help you understand this final scripture I'm going to read to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the famous scripture. You you get it read at weddings all the time, but it'll take a little bit more meaning to you when you understand the three working together. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. No matter what's going on, it's not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. In other words, when you start in a discussion, let me tell you what you did 15 years ago. (laughs) Love, it does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Now, let's say this rest of it together. Love never gives up never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. That's what the God kind of love does. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. We know that physical and emotional love doesn't necessarily last forever, but God's love lasts forever. It never fails This is what you see at the core of people who stay married on the long haul that have really good marriages. Now, I'm not saying every marriage that stays married a long time is a good marriage. I've seen marriages stay married 50 years. They just endured one another. They didn't enjoy their marriage. But if you want to do it the biblical way, you understand I'm in this for the long haul. 
I need to make this marriage last forever, so I need to work on all three, the phileo part of it, the emotional part of it, and the God part of it. It starts with the God part of it, which then makes our love come out in the other ways in a godly way. Now, here's what I know. If you're married right now, listen to me carefully, and you're having trouble in your marriage, listen to me carefully. If you're having trouble in your marriage, I'll bet you there's a voice arguing with what I've been saying, speaking to you today, saying things like, ah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, I don't agree with that. That's where you have to make a decision. That's where you have to make a decision. Are you going to listen to that voice? Or are you going to listen to what God is saying? Are you listening to what God's word says? Or are you going to listen to that voice continue to convince you you're married to the wrong person? Are you listening to me? I want to say this because there are some people in every service that are starting to think maybe this is not right. Maybe this is, this is not going to work out. And, and they're starting to think it's an option. And I'm just telling you, when you have a covenant with each other, it's not an option. So you learn how to forgive, you learn how to work through it, you get the counseling you need to do, whatever you have to do to get that thing to come back together. Amen. But I'm gonna say another word to you. If you're single and you're currently dating somebody, listen to me carefully, and you're currently dating somebody and they're not fully committed to the Lord, what is up with that? You're having to drag them to church? You're having to drag any kind of conversation with God out of them? That is nothing but trouble in the future. Let me spare you as your daddy right now. Who's your daddy? I'm your daddy right now. <laughs> Let me speak daddy stuff, stuff to you right now. If I, if I see this happening, when I see this with people, I always tell them, look, like I had somebody come up to me this, just not too long ago and say, hey, I'm having trouble in my relationship uh, you know, we got two kids together. We're, we're just really having a lot of problems. What do I do? And uh, I said, well, well, give me your situation. Well, we've been living together for 10 years. Well, that's the problem right there. At, at, at the root, do you honestly think God's going to come and straighten this all out while you continue to live in disobedience? You got to separate. You can't live together and be in God's grace. You can't stay in that kind of setting and immorality. You got to break away and do what's necessary. And sometimes the best way to do it is just to go to forward and break all your soul ties. Break all your soul ties to your past illicit relationships. Get through all those things. Get some counseling in your relationship and live apart for a season. And then maybe learn how to come back together in the fashion of God. Amen? That's, that's some counsel for some of you. That's some counsel. But if you're in a dating relationship right now that you know is not godly, then you're, you're headed for trouble. That's going to be heartache. I'm telling you, I've seen it come a thousand times with people, single people, that just ignore God's word and do it their way and think that because we're compatible, this is going to last forever. It's going to change. And, and I'm, I'm old enough to tell you, I've seen my share of it. Amen? I want, to pre I want to help you avoid that. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And I always tell this to single people because there's, well, I'm, you know, I'm not meeting anybody that's really godly. You're not meeting anybody that's godly because you're not godly. <laughs> godly people meet each other, and ungodly people flock together. If you keep getting these bozos asking you out for dates, <laughs> let that be a sign unto thee. Y'all all right out there? I, I tell people all the time, I say, if you want to meet the right person, the right person, be the right person. Work on you. You can't, you can't work on some guy or girl being attracted to you. Work on you. Get involved in the church. Serve in the church. Do things for God. And you'll find that there are people like you that are out there just like you. They've been searching just like you. And they haven't been able to find anything online because most people online aren't following God. And, they, and, they, and you just, all of a sudden, you find yourself paralleling with that person. It doesn't matter if you're 40, 50, 60 years old. That's good news for some of you. Some of you have been hanging on, 50, 60 years old. <laughs> Mr. Wright. Be Mrs. Wright first, amen? And I'll tell you, when you do those things, here's what I know. God will bring the right person in your life. 
He will bring the right person at the right time. Amen? All right, I want you to take a moment. Hamilton Mill, I want you to just bow your heads, close your eyes. I want everybody here in the chapel, just bow your heads, close your eyes. I want you to think about what I just said. I want you to think about where you are in your relational story right now. If you're single and you're in a bad situation or bad hooked up with the wrong person, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to keep that relationship going? Or are you going to... Are you going to let your feelings override what you know is good sense? Are you going to follow the path of God and do what's right by God? If you're married and you're thinking about leaving that marriage, are you going to let your feelings drive you in that direction? Or are you going to let God's covenant hold you in there and figure out how to make this thing work? Whatever it is, God can heal it. He can restore it. He can bring the right situation into play when we put him at the center of of our relationship. So Jesus, I'm praying that over every person here, singles, marrieds, people who've been through broken relationships, people even that are living outside of your will, that you would begin to arrest our hearts right now as it pertains to family. That you bring us back to the truth that sets us free and help us to break free from just being controlled by our emotions, our feelings. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling in these areas, God, that you give them the courage to make the right decisions going forward. I wanna see new stories created, God, in these people. I wanna see everyone have a good story for their family, a good story for their children to look up to, a good story for their family to enjoy and, and, and rally around, God, instead of constantly being heartache. So would you begin to heal any brokenness in our marriages right now, begin to heal any dysfunction from our past? Would you begin to break any strongholds and soul ties that we might have formed that are not godly? And would you begin to create a story of covenant love in our life? I pray that over us today in Jesus' name. And everybody that agreed with that prayer, say amen and amen. God bless you.